Welcome, everyone. I'm Anne Havmeyer, Director of the Norfolk, Connecticut Library, and it is my pleasure to be doing this webinar with librarians Libby O'Neill in Massachusetts, Orla Kennelly in the UK, Jessica Chamberlain in Nebraska, and Victoria Linetti in Virginia. This webinar is being recorded, and if you have questions for us, please put them in the Q&A, which you can find at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer them at the end of our program. This webinar was Libby's brainstorm, so I will let her take it from here. Thank you, Anne. Um, as Anne said, my name is Libby O'Neill. I am the director of the Norfolk, Massachusetts Library. Um, I got this idea from um, another Massachusetts library. They were reaching out to their um, sister library in the UK to do a virtual program. And I thought, what a wonderful idea. And wouldn't it be great to even expand further on this idea? Um, and so I reached out to all of these Norfolk libraries in the UK, Connecticut, Virginia, Nebraska. And I thought it would be really fun to um, take advantage of virtual programming where we could all come together to um, talk about and compare our Norfolks. Um, before COVID, the, something like this never would have been possible. So I think it's really cool that we can make it possible now. Um, uh, today, we're gonna be talking about, each of us are gonna take a little time to talk about um, the history of um, our Norfolk. And then we will talk about some um, common questions, and so we will compare um, with our answers, our Norfolks, and then um, each of us will talk a little bit about the history of our library. We will continue the um, order by oldest Norfolk to youngest Norfolk. And um, with that, I would like to have Orla from uh, the UK kick it off on the history of her Norfolk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Libby. I am now going to share my screen with everybody. Hopefully you can all see that right now. Great. So thank you very much uh, for that lovely introduction. It's really great to be here with you today, virtually. Um, and it is, I guess, one of the one of the only benefits of the pandemic is that we're now able to do um, exciting international programs like this. So my name is Orla Kennelly, and I am the Trust Librarian at the American Library, Memorial to the Second Air Division, Eighth Air Force, United States Army Air Forces. So I am coming to you today from the original Norfolk in England. I normally um, would be coming to you from the library, uh, from the American Library, which is located inside the Norfolk and Norwich Millennium Library, which is right in the middle of the city of Norwich, which is in the county of Norfolk. Um, but I'm actually coming to you from my living room right now. So this is um, a little bit of an idea um, of, of whereabouts I am. So. Norwich, the city, uh, is in the county of Norfolk, and Norfolk is in an area that is known as East Anglia. So East Anglia, East England. So we are on the east coast of England. So you can see us here um, on the left hand side, marked out in red. We have a huge coastline in Norfolk. It's one of the best things about living here, actually. Um, and then just for a little bit more context, on the right hand side, you can see a map of Norfolk with some of the main areas and some of the main towns mapped out on it. So if you can see, there is a little icon for the Norwich Airport. So I'm about a mile and a half right now from the Norwich Airport. So that's that's where I am coming to you from today. So our county of Norfolk has a population of about a million people. And it is, as you can see from the map, um, a little bit out of the way, maybe some would say. We are kind of up on the, up on the eastern corner of England. We have got one city, which is Norwich, and then a number of towns, which are, are marked out on the map there. Market towns, we would call them, places like uh, Swatham and Deerham, as well as lots of coastal towns and villages, which are very, very popular uh, in the summertime with tourists from all over the place. Um, but, uh, you know, particularly lots of people coming up from London. So 
I would imagine that for many of you who are joining us from the Norfolks in the United States, if you have been to England at all, you may have been to London. So we are northeast of London, about 100 miles away from London, and it takes us about 90 minutes to get to London on the train. And our Norfolk borders the counties of Suffolk and Cambridgeshire and Lincolnshire. And of course, our biggest border then is with the North Sea. So this is a slightly older um, vista of Norwich, what the city did look like in the last century. It's changed a little bit since then. And then going back, this is a print of Norfolk uh, from the 1800s. This street looks very different now. This is an area called London Street. And if you were to continue down there, you would actually find yourself on the Norwich Market, which is where the library is located. London Street uh, is actually pedestrianised now, and it was the first pedestrianised street in the United Kingdom, something that we're very proud of in Norfolk. Norfolk has a very interesting um, and varied history. And one of the things that it's quite famous for um, is chocolate. So we had a number of uh, industries in the in the county um, and chocolate was one of the, the, the main industries up until the last century. And here are some of the women at work in one of the local chocolate factories. The picture that I'm using here comes from a collection that's called Picture Norfolk, which is part of our public library program to make the uh, picture and image collections of the county accessible. And Picture Norfolk is searchable on the web, um, so you can view the photographs from anywhere in the world. Norwich has a population, as I said, of about, um, or, or, or Norfolk has a population of about a million people. Um, it's a pretty small county, I suppose, in some ways, and, and Norwich is a pretty small city of, of about 150,000. But during the medieval time period, actually, Norwich was the second city in the UK, second only to London. And we have more medieval churches than anywhere else um, in the country outside of London. And this picture here um, is a real coming together of the ecclesiastical and the industrial history of the county. This is a picture of the inside of the Norwich Cathedral, the main cathedral, the Church of England Cathedral. And this is their font. Um, and it's actually made up of two chocolate barrels from the local Cayley's Chocolate Factory. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Coleman's Mustard. Coleman's Mustard started life in Norfolk as well. And this is Jeremiah Coleman, uh, the founder of that lovely company. Um, we are going to come back shortly and talk a little bit about our libraries in particular. Um, and then I will be uh, starting the story of my library with this slide. So for now, I'm going to leave it there. Um, thank you all very much for listening. And um, I'll be back um, after the rest of the Norfolks have spoken. Um, I am, of course, coming to you from the original uh, Norfolk, England. And I am now going to hand over to uh, one of the American Norfolks, which was inspired by us. And that is Norfolk, Virginia. So I think I'm handing over to Victoria in Virginia. Hello everyone. Um, yes, I am Victoria Levy from Norfolk Public Library in Norfolk, Virginia. And can... um, so Norfolk, Virginia is in the far southeastern corner of Virginia. It is a coastal area with um, a very large military presence, very large transportation presence. And we are very watery. We're a humid subtropical climate. So we rain about one third of the entire year and it snows about two inches every year. All right. We are known for our mermaids. Since 2002, we have had mermaids all across the city. Um, we have them for NATO, we have them for various city departments, um, different artists in the area can adopt one and decorate however they would like. We have also given them to our sister cities, so Norfolk County, UK has one. I believe it's decorated in flowers to um, memorialize their uh, flower um, show that they have on a regular basis. And these are a really cool symbol of our city. We are primarily known for having the largest naval base in the world, but we also have 14 military bases in the entire Hampton Roads region. 
that is the region surrounding Norfolk, made up of seven separate cities. We are also the home of the NATO Allied Command Transformation, which is the North American headquarters for NATO, and the Joint Forces Staff College, which is where the U.S. military comes to get special training. One especially cool thing about Norfolk is that we have a very deep harbor. So in downtown Norfolk, next to our Nauticus Museum, we have the Iowa class battleship, the USS Wisconsin, which is actually parked right up against um, the street. So you can see in the second photo that it is just up against the street. We call that Waterside Drive. And you can walk five feet off of the um, Pier and it's right there. So people can tour that as part of a military museum. We also have uh, the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. In the Hampton Roads region, there are three separate bridge tunnels. A bridge tunnel is where you have partially a bridge and then it goes underneath the tunnel. This is especially important for ship transportation as large ships are able to go over the tunnel portions. Uh, this area is Part of the Hampton Roads region uh, with roads being an old form of a word for waterways. So the Hampton Roads region is a place where ships could actually pass through. Civil War buffs might recognize Hampton Roads as the place where the Monitor and the Merrimack ships battled during the Civil War. We are also the home of the Attics Theater. This is a very important piece of African-American history. The Attics Theater was called the Apollo of the South. Um, various artists such as Cab Calloway, Duke Ellington, and uh, a few others have come and performed at this. It is still open to this day. It was recently refurbished. And you can still see the original fire curtain, which has a um, painting of Crispus Attucks, who was the first martyr of the American Revolution. We also have rail transportation. Until extremely recently, we were the home of the Norfolk Southern Railway. And that is a photo of it on the left. And we also have our own light rail system in downtown. So a little on the history of Norfolk. We originally founded in 1619 as part of Elizabeth City. As Orla stated, we were directly influenced by Norfolk County, England. Adam Thorogood was a native of Norfolk, England, and he specifically named our area after it. Uh, we have divided quite a few times, and because of this, you can actually find multiple places in cities such as Portsmouth and Chesapeake that still retain the Norfolk name. So just a few more facts about Norfolk. We're the third most populous city in Virginia with about 250,000 residents. We are extremely diverse. Uh, we're about 47% Caucasian, 41% African-American, and 8% Latinx. We have a distinct traditional accent called the Tidewater accent, and we're home to an airport, PETA, a large medical college, an HBCU, and uh, what was originally part of the College of William and Mary. And now we will move on to Anne in Connecticut. Thank you, Victoria. Let me just, just one second. There we go. Great. Okay. Um, well, Norfolk, Connecticut is the smallest of the Norfolks that we're dealing with today. Um, it's a town of about 1,600 people. And nestled in the Northwest Hills of Connecticut. This is a vintage postcard, and you will find Norfolk just under the E in Connecticut. I've underlined it in red. It is a young town by Connecticut standards, as it was not incorporated until 1758, over 130 years after the colony of Connecticut was established in the early 1600s. The land in the northwest corner of the colony was rocky and hilly terrain, as illustrated on this map. Unlike the Connecticut River Valley in the center of the state, this land was not conducive to farming, and so it was not until a century after the colony was founded that lots were sold in the town. 
that would become Norfolk. The land was first offered for sale in 1731 and all but one of the buyers returned their lots after finding out that the rocky soil was undesirable for farming. That lone buyer, Cornelius Brown, arrived in Norfolk in 1744. The cold temperatures in this hilly terrain also made for a shorter growing season. So it took another 15 years for the town to grow big enough with some 100 inhabitants to warrant incorporation in 1758. Most of the early inhabitants were farmers and they were primarily dairy farms. During the late winter, farmers tapped their maple trees to make maple syrup. This is a farm actually where I live now. It was founded in 1757. A diary records in 1774 that 6, 16,000 pounds of sugar, maple sugar, um, were made in Norfolk. That's quite a lot of maple sugar and people still tap trees here. The 19th century brought some industry to the town. Um, as illustrated here, the Norfolk and New Brunswick Hosiery Company was founded um, near the Blackberry River, which provided water to run the water wheels. And the Etna Silk Company manufactured sewing silk in Norfolk. But by and large, the 20th century development and construction largely passed Norfolk by, and today the town displays the architectural charm and country town ambiance of a century ago. It was at that time, during the heyday of the summer resort era, that members of the town's founding family, the Battelles, helped establish the town's present character. They did this by launching a building campaign at the end of the 19th century, that physically transformed the town. Pictured here is the village green with Battelle Fountain designed by Stanford White and given by the family in 1889. Also along the green is Battelle Chapel built in 1887, pictured here in an early 20th century photograph with a set of glorious Tiffany stained glass windows representing the four seasons and a sunrise in the center. And of course, across the green is the Norfolk Library, constructed in 1888, designed by the architect George Keller and given by Isabella Eldridge, a Battelle granddaughter, in memory of her parents, Joseph and Sarah Battelle Eldridge. This is um, a bird's eye view of the town, and you can see um, the Norfolk Library just under the red arrow. Like many of the towns in the Litchfield Hills and Berkshires of southwestern Massachusetts, Norfolk has an influx of weekenders and summer residents who are attracted to the area for its nature preserves and cultural offerings. Norfolk is home to five state parks and the 6,000 acre Great Mountain Forest. It has an active land trust which has opened many hiking trails throughout town. This is a photograph of the Great beautiful Great Mountain Forest, which is open for um, people to cross-country ski and hike. It is also a destination for music lovers and has been for over a century when Norfolk residents Carl and Ellen Battelle Steckel founded the legendary Norfolk Music Festival in 1906. They built the so-called Music Shed, beautiful Redwood Music Shed, on their property and the festival took place each year for three days in June. It drew thousands of music lovers and well-known composers such as Rachmaninoff and Sibelius to Norfolk. The property was left in trust for the use of Yale University when the Steckles died and today it houses the Yale Summer School of Music and Art which hosts the Norfolk Chamber Music Festival in the Music Shed pictured here and I will talk a little bit more about that later, but for now I am passing it on to Libby in Massachusetts. Great, thanks Anne. Um, let me just share my screen here. One moment. All right, so I am going to be 
talking about um, Norfolk, Massachusetts. So let me uh, give one moment. That's the beginning here. Okay. Um, so Norfolk, Massachusetts, uh, it is a uh, residential community that has experienced rapid growth, but still retains the characteristics of a small New England town. It is located, as you can see on this map, um, Eastern Massachusetts and about 45 minutes outside of Boston. I put um, a couple uh, current pictures here. The gazebo is on our town hill, which is located right near the library. And the middle picture here um, is a beautiful picture of one of the um, rotaries that we have in town. Um, in Norfolk, there are not many uh, major industries or manufacturers. However, um, in town, we do have some banks, um, variety stores, and a handful of small businesses. So a little bit of history about Norfolk. Um, the area that is now Norfolk was explored by settlers as early as 1632. A company of Governor Winthrop's men set out from Charlestown on an exploration um, up the Charles River. They wanted to own their own land and build on their own settlement. By 1636, the inhabitants had been granted by the general court uh, sole right to a huge tract of land along the river, extending many miles to the south and east. The land included not only the present day of Dedham, but also a dozen other towns, including Norfolk, Franklin, Rentham, Medfield, and Walpole. The area that is now Norfolk was discovered to have lots of excellent fields to farm, as well as brooks and streams for possible mill sites. In 1673, the general court granted the settlers in this area their own town under the name of Rentham. Norfolk sits on what is at the time known as North Rentham, and by the 1740s, the population had grown substantially. In 1795, in the immediate years that followed, a large group moved from Rentham to North Rentham. Uh, much of the population shift revolved around religious uh, dispute between ministers, and this brought the building of a meeting house that was constructed on the top of Town Hill. Uh, the building became the town hall in 1870, but unfortunately burned down in 1922. The top picture here is a panoramic view of the town hill, probably around the 1980s. And then um, I took some current pictures here, um, uh, town hill uh, to the left, that picture of town hill. And this is also um, a picture from town hill, the gazebo, and you can see the blue building um, next to the gazebo is actually part of the library. So uh, the 1800s saw an explosion of factories, job opportunities, and an increase in population. In the 1860s, North Rentham had grown to a point where it was practically functioning as its own town. When it's, uh, with its own meeting house, stores, churches, schools, post office, railroad depots, and factories, residents felt it was time to break away from Rentham and establish an independent town. So on October 18, 1869, residents petitioned the general court for independence and on February 23, 1870, North Rentham and sections of Franklin, Walpole, and Medway were organized into the town known today as Norfolk. At the time, the population was 1,124 and covered 9,000 acres of land. Uh, some other history of the town, uh, Norfolk County Railroad. Uh, in 1846, the Walpole Railroad set out to build a railroad between Dedham and Walpole. Uh, which is a distance of about seven miles. In 1847, the Norfolk County Railroad was continuing this line from Blackstone, Massachusetts, passing through Norfolk. And a few months later, those two companies merged under the name of the Norfolk County Railroad. The line opened for service in the spring of 1849 with stops in Norfolk at Highland Lake, Norfolk Center, and City Mills. Um, you can see the picture towards the left is um, the historic railroad station. And then I took these um, two current pictures towards the, the middle one and the right. Uh, we still do have the train station in the downtown area of the town, only one stop. It is on the Franklin line, uh, the commuter rail we call it, um, between Franklin and it goes into Boston. Norfolk Grange. The Grange Hall was originally built by the Baptist Church in 1863. We used and used for services for 54 years up until 1918. As the Baptist population dwindled by the beginning of the century, the building was sold to the, as, to the Norfolk Grain in 1921. When in 1922, the Norfolk Town Hall burned down and was not replaced, many activities that would normally have been held there were conducted from, at the Grange Hall from 1922 to 1949. 
The Grange Hall became the town meeting room, the voting place, and a hall for school graduations, plays, and dances. Norfolk um, Roman Catholic Congregation held services here from 1947 to 1915, and even the town library was housed here in the rear of the building from 1922 to 1951. So um, a little bit about Norfolk today. Uh, the town encompasses 15 square miles. Areas of timber and brushland still exist, though the once numerous farms have given way to housing developments. Um, the 2020 population approximately was 12,199, predominantly in English-speaking affluent community. It was recently ranked number 31 in terms of the safest community in the United States. We have um, the beautiful Stony Brook Audubon Wildlife Sanctuary in Norfolk. We have two operational prisons, Massachusetts Correctional Institution, um, which was built in 1927, and Pondville Correctional Center. We um, had even a third prison in our town, Bay State Correctional Center, but that did close down um, in 2015. We have three churches, Emmanuel Baptist Church, that Norfolk uh, Federated Church, which is a picture um, you see here at the, on the slide, St. Jude's Catholic Church, and we have um, uh, two elementary schools and something that um, is not uh, as typical in Massachusetts, where um, Norfolk participates in a regional district with Rentham and Plainville. So um, the students attend a regional King Philip Middle School and High School. And I will stop here and hand it over to um, Jessica in Nebraska. Thank you. Okay, so a little bit about Norfolk, Nebraska. Uh, we are located pretty much here in the middle of the country of the United States in the northeast corner of Nebraska. We have a population of 24,210 around. Uh, we were founded in 1866 by 44 German families who came uh, by wagon train from Wisconsin and you can see their, their trail there. We do still have a structure built around that time. Uh, the, the Detterman cabin was built in 1868. It is still standing and has been moved a couple of times around town and now stands on the grounds of our historical museum. We are named for the North Fork of the Elkhorn River, which flows through town. Um, it fueled the mill when the town was first growing and uh, now is used primarily for recreation. We are the traditional homeland to the Ponca and Omaha tribes. Uh, during settlement, uh, the Omaha tribe was moved to a reservation nearby on the Nebraska-Iowa border, uh, in, is still within their traditional homelands. Uh, the Ponca tribe was forcibly removed to Oklahoma. And uh, if you don't know the story of Chief Standing Bear, I encourage you to look that up and uh, check it out. Um, he did try to come back to Nebraska to bury his son and uh, ended up in a landmark court case involving uh, civil rights, Native American rights, and was a real turning point uh, for some of the rights of Native Americans in the country. So the Ponca never were successful though in getting a reservation back on their traditional homelands. And so they do have an agency in town that serves uh, their tribal members who still live here. We are Nebraska, we are very rural, we are very agricultural um, and uh, that's just part of our um, of who we are. But here in Norfolk, the uh, agriculture is not our primary uh, employer. Healthcare, we have a big hospital and lots of doctor's offices, um, education with our public school system and our community college and manufacturing uh, are our biggest employers. We have a steel mill in town, a rubber hose plant, another um, iron and metal company, and lots of traditional manufacturing things. We are the biggest town around at, at less than 25,000. We are still the largest town in all of Northeast Nebraska. So you can see there on the map how far you have to drive to get to towns of similar size. Um, so we, we are a regional hub and um, which, which is nice. It allows us to have a lot of uh, retail and shopping and restaurants that we, you wouldn't normally find in a town of just 25,000. We're very outdoorsy, lots of hunting and fishing, uh, sports and recreation uh, opportunities here. We have lots of lakes. We have a, a new water park, a brand new skate park. We have a couple of disc golf courses um, and a lot of uh, hiking, uh, biking trails as well. 
Uh, there's some of those different restaurants that you may not expect to find in a rural town in Nebraska, but we do have worldwide cuisine um, and some wonderful uh, award-winning restaurants. And then lots of unique local shops. We're just a little too small for a lot of big box or national chains to locate here, uh, but that allows us to have a lot of unique shops that are just our own and locally owned and operated. All in all, it's a beautiful place and our slogan is the good life. Nebraska is the good life. And uh, this is certainly one place where you can do that. So I'm gonna throw it back, I think, is it to Ann or to Libby? Um. To me, I think just so I can share my screen here and then I will hand it over to Libby as the, um, we're now in the section of um, our questions and answers for the five of us comparing, comparing notes. So <laughs> let me start the slideshow here and hand it over to Libby. Okay, um, we thought it would be fun to have some common questions answered about Norfolk uh, to compare each, each Norfolk. So I will start off with saying, with asking, how do you pronounce your Norfolk? Norfolk? And um, I will pass it to Orla. Libby, so we say Norfolk. That's how we pronounce it, which I, I think, um, I think other people have different takes on it though, right? <laughs> We do. Yeah. Um, the, the main issue we have here is actually not with our Norfolk, but the county town or the, the capital city of our Norfolk is called Norwich, which is spelled N-O-R-W-I-C-H. And so you think would be pronounced Norwich, but is actually Norwich to rhyme with porridge. So in actual fact, I think the pronunciation of our Norfolk is, is quite simple in comparison to our main city in our Norfolk. So I guess I'm uh, passing over to Victoria in Virginia. Um, yes, so our Norfolk has three different standard pronunciations. In the old Tidewater accent, it's Norfolk. They don't pronounce ours, the non-rhotic accent. And there's also Norfolk and Norfolk. So because we have a large transient population due to the military, you often hear Norfolk as well. Um, but it's either Norfolk, Norfolk, or Norfolk. And um, take it away, Anne. Well, I guess I have a new one, Norfolk. Um, although I pronounce the town as Orla pronounces her city, Norfolk. Um, but here in uh, Norfolk, um, really a lot of people call, a, a lot, especially old timers for you know, and also some newcomers uh, prefer to say it that way. We say Norfolk. Um, I, we also hear quite a bit of uh, Norfolk and Norfolk, but it's definitely in our town, the million dollar question. And many people come into the library and say, just how do you pronounce your town's name? So I'm passing that on now to Libby. Okay, um, it's funny you say that, Anne, because I am sort of new to the town. I've been the director um, there for three years. And when I got the job, I was like, how do you pronounce this town? Um, <laughs> I would say the most common is that there are three ways in my uh, town to pronounce it. Um, I always say Norfolk um, because I am new and I think newer people do pronounce it that way. Um, some people do say Norfolk. Uh, one theory is that because it um, um, because it used to be North Rentham, so one theory that I have heard is because it's um, north at the fork, so Norfolk. I'm not sure. There's no historical evidence for that to base it on, I don't think. But um, I also scoured our community Facebook page, um, and there are long debates about how to pronounce this little town in Massachusetts. Um, so again, there's Norfolk, Norfolk. Um, Norfolk and Norfolk. And um, I will now pass it on to Jessica in Nebraska. Okay, our traditional way to say our name is Norfolk. And that is because we were settled on the North Fork of the Elkhorn River. And so when we um, actually sent off to the post office to have our town officially named Norfolk, they assumed that we misspelled it and changed the spelling from N-O-R-F-O-R-K to N-O-R-F-O-L-K. 
So we are, uh, and we're also a lot of the people who grew up here or have been here a long time do still say Norfolk, uh, but uh, Norfolk is also said often and is also an acceptable pronunciation. Okay, so the second question is, um, what is your Norfolk known for, Orla? Thank you. So uh, I figured that with the audience in mind that it would be interesting to talk about uh, how our Norfolk is actually known as being one of the official residences of the British royal family. So I imagine that there are probably a few people on the call today who are fans of the crown and may be familiar with this building. So this is the Sandringham, uh, Sandringham Hall on the Sandringham estate and it's in the north of the county of Norfolk. So the British royal family uh, usually are resident in London and have their main family home there. Sandringham um, is in the Sandringham Royal Park and it's been associated with the royals since the 1860s. So it was actually uh, first used as a residence by the family of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. The current royal family still use Sandringham. The Queen has in the past tended to spend a lot of time there and she normally travels here by train actually from London. So she gets the train to Kings Lynn. And Sandringham is her official home on the estate, but the estate is also home to Amner Hall, which is the official residence of William and Catherine, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, when they're not in London. So, uh, yeah, that is um, that is one of the things that um, my Norfolk is, is famous for. And also, uh, this came up when we were chatting earlier, the panellists. Norfolk is also, or at least was, the home of Olivia Coleman, who plays the Queen uh, in, in The Crown on Netflix. So I'll hand over to Victoria and Virginia. Um, my Norfolk is known for the military. It is a hub of military activity. Our deep natural waters of our harbor allows um, vessels of all types to dock there. So located at the northwestern tip of Norfolk along the Elizabeth River is the Norfolk Naval Station. This is the largest naval base in the world. It houses about 150,000 military personnel. It's the home of the U.S. Atlantic Fleet um, as well as the USS Comfort. It has 14 piers, 75 ships, including aircraft carriers, cruisers, destroyers, amphibious ships, submarines, a range of supplies and logistical ships, as well as 134 aircraft. Uh, the Blue Angels are also out of this area. Each year, uh, 3,100 ship movements occur and 100,000 flight operations. And of course, we also have the NATO Allied Transformation, which is the military compound of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the Joint Forces Staff College. So now on to Anne in Connecticut. Well, our Norfolk is known to be the coldest part of the state of Connecticut and is therefore called the icebox of Connecticut. This is how we get into the news every winter and we are almost in the news every winter. When it snows, you will see the local affiliates of NBC, CBS and ABC News in the center of town with their snowmobiles or whatever they're called, snow monsters and um, finding residents to interview. And along the lines of that winter theme, we are also home of the Norfolk Curling Club. And curling was a sport that was um, started here uh, in 1956 and it's very popular. They have bond spiels a lot. And I think um, it's um, a wonderful activity for many Norfolkians. So passing it on to Libby in Massachusetts. Great, thanks Anne. Um, I would say that um, we're known for uh, being next door to Foxborough. We um, are, uh, Foxborough has the Gillette Stadium with, with where the New England Patriots play. Um, many, uh, uh, not many, but some um, New England Patriots football players have lived in Norfolk. And, um, and so I would say we could be known close to that, although we can't claim that. Um, when I asked my staff about Norfolk and what it was known for, because um, I'm still being new to the town, they said that we were known for not being known, um, 
we have no highway access into town. Um, and so even when you ask people in Massachusetts, the people that live in Massachusetts, they say, um, uh, we don't even know where Norfolk is. And then we say, well, we're near Gillette Stadium. Um, but I thought that was pretty cool. And as I mentioned in the, um, in the history is that we have, we had three active prisons in the town. So I would say that we um, uh, might be most known for that. And passing it on to Jessica, Nebraska. Okay, I mentioned this in my talk as well, but I think we're really most known uh, locally for being that regional hub um, of Northeast Nebraska. So if there's something happening uh, in the state uh, or in this area of the state, whether it's a convention or a concert or uh, you know an, an innovative program or something like that, it's most likely happening in Norfolk or nearby. So that's probably what we're most known for. Great. Um, our next question is, what is, is your Nor Norfolk's uh, most interesting story? Orla? Thank you. So they say that self-praise is no praise, um, but I am going to use uh, the library that I work at and our story actually um, as an example of a very interesting story uh, that has occurred in Norfolk. So I work at the American Library, which is the memorial to the 2nd Air Division, 8th Air Force, United States Army Air Forces. And our library is the only public library war memorial in the United Kingdom. And it is quite unusual actually to have a, a war memorial uh, library um, anywhere really outside of, of the US. So we're here because of what happened in this country in the 1940s. And of course, uh, in the 1940s, we had World War II, which America joined slightly later on in the war. And over the course of the last couple of years of World War II, over a million American service personnel came to pass through the United Kingdom, and a huge number of them actually came through Norfolk. So we were subject to what they called at the time the friendly invasion. Huge air bases sprung up all around the county of Norfolk. So you had little villages of maybe 300, 400 people, and all of a sudden, 3,000 American service personnel living on a base just outside the village. So the 2nd Air Division alone had 19 air bases in this area, but there were also other divisions as well as um, the, the 9th Air Force also. And this huge influx of American service personnel had a massive impact on the county of Norfolk, massive impact on the landscape alone. So when you think about all the concrete that had to go down for all those runways, all the buildings that were put up. So the landscape of Norfolk was completely changed by World War II. And also, of course, uh, the Americans brought with them their own traditions and their own cultures and their own foods and their own ways of saying things. So for sure, there was a big impact on the way, I guess, that people related to popular culture. Lots of people who were here in Norfolk, you know, wouldn't have ever met an American before. And all of a sudden there was 3000 of them living right beside your house. Things like baseball games and the eating of donuts and chewing gum, um, all of that was kind of brought to Norfolk during um, the time that the Americans were here in the 1940s. And that's the reason that our library is still here today. So uh, with that, and I will be talking more about the library later on, of course, um, I'm gonna pass back to Victoria in Virginia. So my story um, dates back to uh, 1776 during the American Revolutionary War. Due to the heavy merchant presence in Norfolk, it was a loyalist stronghold during the war. And when the Continental Army forces captured and occupied Norfolk, the then governor, Lord Dunmore, fled. He ordered British ships to fire on the town. And it's unclear today how many casualties there were, but the fire burned for three days and destroyed almost 900 buildings. Because of this, most of our buildings don't date before the 19th century. But one building that did survive was St. Paul's Episcopal Church, which was built a few decades before the war. St. Paul's was relatively unharmed by the bombardment, except for one cannonball that you can see in the picture on the right here that lodged itself in the southeastern wall. It is still available to be seen, and they even put up a plaque that uh, commemorates it. And this church is a historic landmark, an example of Georgian colonial era architecture. It was the only major building to receive little damage. And it is also where, during World War II, Lord Louis Mountbatten visited. 
and where the five-star general Douglas MacArthur, whose mother was from Norfolk, had his funeral service. His memorial, the MacArthur Memorial, is immediately across the street. And now Anne in Connecticut. Well, it was hard to figure out what our most interesting story was, but um, I'm going to go back to the uh, Norfolk Music Festival, which I mentioned before, uh, was founded um, in 19, early 1900s by Carl and Ellen Battelle Steckel. And um, it, he, they built the legendary um, music shed um, on their property. This is a photograph of the interior of the shed um, shortly after it was built. And as I said, it drew thousands of music lovers and well-known composers. But I think one of the most interesting stories is the fact that the composer Jean Sibelius um, made his only visit to this country um, in Norfolk. And he appeared here in 1914. He had been invited uh, by Carl and Ellen Battelle Steckel to appear in the uh, music shed and to compose a piece. He composed um, he conducted the premiere of his piece, Oceanides, and of course, Finlandia. Um, the Steckles actually met him in Norfolk when he arrived on the ship in his Finnish woolens. And the story is that Carl Steckel immediately took him to buy a linen suit because it was warm in June. And um, after his performance at the shed, uh, they took him to New Haven where he received an honorary degree from Yale University. And then they took him to see Niagara Falls, and then he went back to Finland. So um, that's a, a pretty cool for Norfolk to have this um, one appearance by this great composer um, for our town's history. So passing it on to Libby. Thanks, Anne. Um, I could not decide between two stories, so I thought I'd quickly share um, two of them. This is a picture of the Tramp House, which is located on Town Hill and also very close to the library. Um, the Norfolk lockup uh, or jail was built in 1886 at the cost of $450 and 51 cents on Town Hill. In late 1800s, many a wandering tramp, as they were called, spent the night in this building. In earlier years, tramps were taken in by private citizens who were then reimbursed by the town. Later in its history, it was used as an additional classroom for the Norfolk Center School. Students learned sloids, carpentry, and home economics there. And then, Anne, if you don't mind going to the next yep. slide. Um, this is the crypt, which is actually, you can see the blue building in the background is actually the library. So we have a crypt right in front of our library, which I think is so cool. Um, it is obviously not in operation anymore, but, um, the Ware Crypt may be the oldest structure in Norfolk and was saved by state law because it was a structure associated with burials and cemeteries. It was built by the Ware family as a place to temporarily house bodies um, if there was a death in the winter um, and if the ground was too frozen to dig a grave. Uh, no one was per permanently buried in the crypt, but um, and they, they left um, promptly when the, the spring thaw happened and were, and were buried. It is documented that even as recently as the 1920s, the Ware Crypt was being used. And I just, again, I just think it's so cool um, that it is right outside uh, the library entrance. And now I will turn it over to Jessica in Nebraska. Okay, so it's always hard for me to pick what is the most interesting, but here is an interesting story from our town. Um, in the early 1900s, there were three brothers, the Hall brothers, and they got their start uh, with a Norfolk postcard company. Uh, this was during the big postcard craze of the early 1900s, and they had at one point carried in their store, the bookstore downtown, uh, nearly a million postcards in stock in their, uh, in their store at any one time. Uh, one brother, uh, Joyce, that you see there pictured, he was the youngest brother. He was very ambitious. He moved down to Kansas City to start like a branch operation for their store and try to grow their business. Um, he was very, very successful. And in 1921, all operations of Hall's bookstore, postcard store and everything were moved to Kansas City where they focused on something new that you see there called Christmas letters. And they capitalized on this new craze of Christmas letters they soon changed the name of their company to something that you will uh, certainly recognize to Hallmark. 
So Hallmark Cards got their start here in Norfolk with as a postcard company. So back to Libby for our next question. Okay, what is special to your Nor Norfolk? Um, and I'll pass it to Orla in the UK. Thanks again, Libby. So what you're looking at here um, is a canary, which is now used as the emblem of the Norwich City Football Club. And I'm sure that the football club is a very special story in and of itself. Um, but I want to talk a little bit more about the canary, um, because the history of the canary bird is really kind of synonymous now with Norwich. The birds, the canaries, came over to Norwich as the pets of a group of people who were known as the strangers, and that was in the 16th century. And these strangers were groups of Protestant refugees who were seeking refuge, seeking political asylum from the Catholic low countries of Europe. The canary birds, they sang to workers when they worked on the machines, so they were like medieval radios. When the machine was working, the canaries were replying, so they helped to keep the strangers company, I guess, overnight and to keep them awake, probably also. So the Canary is associated now with the football club, but very much with the city of Norwich and the county of Norfolk. And it's a really re great reminder of how incredibly welcoming Norfolk and Norwich have been to people uh, over the years. So starting off with these refugees in the Middle Ages, and it's said that at that time, about a third of all of the people in Norwich were speaking in other languages and they were new arrivals to the city. So Norwich and Norfolk have continued to be a really welcoming place. In the 1940s, as I talked about earlier, we had this huge influx of Americans who came over here because of the war. So my library exists because of the presence of those US forces here during the 40s. And now in our main library building in uh, Norwich, we share office space with a team of people called the People From Abroad team, and they help to resettle refugees who are newly arriving now from Syria and Afghanistan. So that is what is special about my Norfolk, is how welcoming it is to people from other places, including me. I don't have an English accent, in case you hadn't noticed. I'm from the west of Ireland. Um, and the canary is just, I think, a really lovely symbol of that story. I'm going to hand back to Victoria in Virginia. All right, I'm going to talk about something a little different than any of the things I've talked about before with Norfolk, Virginia. We are the international headquarters of the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals. Uh, this means that all of their operations start out from here. They also have a lot of mobile clinics and vet services that they offer. So low cost, spay and neuter, um, euthanasia, vet services. Uh, they are known for being rather controversial. Um, but it's a really interesting little tidbit that we have the headquarters of this international organization right out of our downtown area. And Anne, uh, take it away. I have chosen our literary heritage as something very special to our town, notably here the founding of New Directions Publishing House, still active in New York. It was founded in the 1930s by James Lachlan, pictured here, known as Jay, pictured here as a young Harvard grad, an aspiring poet. Um, on the right is his mentor, Ezra Pound, and he had gone to Italy to visit Ezra Pound. Um, after Ezra reportedly told Jay that he would never be a great poet, he suggested that Jay publish writers considered unpublishable in this country at that time. So Jay moved into a cottage on his aunt Lila Carlisle's property here in Norfolk and published the likes of Ezra Pound and Tennessee Williams. Many writers were then drawn to Norfolk because of New Directions Publishing House. Passing it on to Libby. Um, so uh, I would say that it's, uh, Norfolk used to be very um, rural farm territory. It used to be a getaway vacation spot for, um, to get away from the city and people would come um, to enjoy Highland Lake. However, now I would say um, what's special is uh, we have Stony Brook Wildlife Sanctuary, which is part of the Massachusetts Audubon. Um, they have um, some trails to go hiking. We have, they have nature programs, um, kids programs. So it's just a really special, um, beautiful place in Norfolk. I'm passing it on to Jessica. 
ours is also nature related. We are the um, uh, starting off point of what is called the Cowboy Trail, which is a rails to trails uh, trailway with, uh, where they take old railroad lines that are no longer used and turn them into hiking and biking trails. So it starts here in Norfolk and goes uh, almost 200 miles straight west to Valentine, Nebraska, and uh, stretches across some really beautiful uh, countryside in Northeast Nebraska. So it starts right here in, in one of our city parks. All right, and our last common question um, is, who is or was um, your uh, most famous resident? Uh, Orla, you'll start. Thank you, Livy. So I, uh, again, am hoping that um, this gentleman, yes, this first gentleman, um, will be maybe familiar to some of you. He is Thomas Payne, and he was born in Norfolk. Uh, he was born in a town called Thetford, which is in the south of the county. It's on the road to London. And he was born on January the 29th, 1737. I'm a January 29th as well, actually. So I, I share my birthday with, with Thomas Paine. And I think that he'll be familiar, of course, to British as well as American audiences, because he did eventually leave Norfolk and he immigrated to the American col colonies in 1774. He ended up finding his calling when he got there and he became a writer, but particularly a revolutionary writer. His famous common sense pamphlets uh, written in the 1700s, 1770s supported American independence against the British crown. And his pamphlet sold hundreds of thousands of copies. Founding father John Adams said that without the pen of the author of Common Sense, the sword of Washington would have been raised in vain. Now, he supported American independence, but he also uh, went on to go and travel back to Europe. He ended up becoming involved in the French Revolution. He spent a year in the Bastille and he was only saved from the guillotine by American diplomatic pressure. He, of course, is a writer, as I said, and his book, The Rights of Man, is a liberal classic. It's in every library, I think. But of course, it was a very controversial book at its time, and he was considered quite a dangerous figure in his lifetime. He eventually uh, did get out of Paris after the revolution, and he made his way back to the United States, where he lived out the rest of his days, and he died in 1809. So I'm going to pass over to Victoria and Virginia. Norfolk has a large number of nationally and internationally known people, including actors, musicians, civil rights activists, and authors. One of the most famous people is Tim Reed, a beloved actor known for his roles in WKRP in Cincinnati, Sister Sister, That 70s Show, Greenleaf, and the 1990 version of It. So a question you might be asking is, if Tim Reed is the most famous Norfolk native, who is the most infamous? The answer is a U.S. Navy officer who served in the Pacific Fleet and later was a key figure in endorsing a Republican presidential nominee who was none other than the former White House chief strategist Steve Bannon. So for those wondering, although his memorial is here, General Douglas MacArthur was not a Norfolk native, although his mother was. So now on to Anne in Connecticut. Isabella Beecher Hooker, advocate for women's suffrage, summered in Norfolk during the later years of her life. She lived in Hartford near Mark Twain, who was a visitor to Norfolk when his daughter, Clara Clemens, lived here. Clara was an aspiring singer, and she made her debut here in the Eldridge Gymnasium in 1906. Now, that debut did not go down in history, but the remarks that her father made after her performance did. It was here in Norfolk that he gave his famous speech on stage fright. He did not want to upstage Clara, so he waited until after her performance. Nonetheless, he entirely upstaged her when he said, my heart goes out in sympathy to anyone who is making his first appearance before an audience of human beings. Now on to Libby in Massachusetts. Great. Um, so let's see, um, we have had, as I said, we've had Patriots players live here. Um, 
Tim Hasselback was born in Norfolk. Um, he's also an NFL um, pl uh, player. And our fire chief is a uh, current fire chief is a former Tennessee Titans football player. His name is Aaron Kenny. You can see the um, <laughs> football theme going on here. Um, however, in my research, um, I got a wealth of great information from our um, historical commission's uh, uh, website. And in doing my research, I did find that Malcolm X um, actually resided in one of the Norfolk pres prisons, either in the late 1940s, early 1950s, um, passing it on to Jessica in Nebraska. So we are home to uh, Thurl Ravenscroft, who was the voice of Tony the Tiger and uh, saying that you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch, in the original uh, Grinch cartoon. Uh, but most famously, we are home, a uh, proud hometown of Johnny Carson. He moved here when he was eight and stayed through his high school graduation. He uh, went on to do lots of things, but of course, most famously was the host of The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson from 1962 to 1992. He's been very good to Norfolk, although he ha uh, he came back numerous times during his lifetime, even filmed a TV special here in the 80s. Um, and he and his foundation have been and continue to be very generous to not only the library, but to the community at large, uh, founding uh, or, or donating a lot of money to a lot of different uh, wonderful causes. So uh, Johnny Carson is our most famous. Great, and um, now for our last portion of the presentation, and then we, if we have time, we'll try to um, respond to some of the, the Q and A's that you guys have put there. Um, we're gonna talk a brief overview of our libraries and we'll start with Orla in the UK. Great, thanks Libby. So as I did mention earlier, and, and I showed you this slide, the American Library is located inside the Millennium Library, which is in Norwich, Norfolk. So we have this fantastic, beautiful, uh, very modern building, which was funded by Millennium funding money. So we've been open on this site for 20 years. Uh, the forum is a little bit of um, a phoenix out of the ashes though, because prior to the forum building opening, uh, we did have an old central library in Norwich, which unfortunately did actually burn down in, oh, did actually burn down in 1994. So it was a very catastrophic time. Uh, the library had originally opened in 1963, the American Library. So it had been on this site from 63 to 94 and the building unfortunately really went up in flames. All of the books were lost. It was a very, very tragic time. We've just recently undergone another, uh, I guess, um, rebrand re of the library. Um, this is what we looked like in the beginning of 2020. We closed down in February of last year, so just in time uh, for the pandemic to, to hit us. And we actually were closed until April of 2021 when we reopened as American Library Memorial to the 2nd Air Division, 8th Air Force, United States Army Air Forces um, in a completely refurbished space. So we are a public library and a war memorial, which is very unusual. And at the heart of what we are um, is a place to remember the sacrifice of those Americans, specifically from the 2nd Air Division, who lost their lives flying from air bases in the east of England during World War II. So we have this area here, which is our wall of honour, and just some of the faces of the 7,000 men who are memorialised in our role of honour. So it's very important for us to be able to tell the stories of those individuals and the sacrifices that we made. And we're also very lucky as a library to still be in touch with and have the support of many of the families of those men who were memorialized on that wall of honor. Of course, we are also a library. So uh, books are what we do. And we have a collection of about 4,000 books. A thousand of those are a specialist second air division World War II collection, which includes lots of great things that are privately published or have maybe not been officially published at all, but are put together for us by history enthusiasts or family members of the veterans. So it's a very unique uh, collection. We tell the story of the second air division through a number of different ways. So we have uh, regular display cases, we have some objects, we also have digital screens, 
and central um to i the vista when you walk into the room really is this plane here witchcraft the second air division are most associated with the b24 liberator that was the bomber planes that they flew so we have this uh, beautiful model hanging in the library the second air division flew missions over europe during world war ii and they were involved in some really key moments in the war. They supported D-Day in 1944. Uh, they were also involved in uh, the attacks on the Plowesti oil refinery in Romania in 1943. The library itself has been around since 1963, but the Memorial Trust of the Second Air Division, the registered British charity who fund our operations, has existed since 1945. And we really exist only because of the generosity of those donors. So our operational costs are met by this external charity. And we're very grateful to all of those people over the years who have sent us money and who have supported the library in many different ways. The library as it is now is a very open and flexible space with lots of our library shelving that's movable so that we can host activities and events when, uh, when, when the pandemic allows. We tell the story of the Second Air Division, but we also tell people a little bit of the story of the United States. And we tell the stories in, of the states in chapters like uh, America on the international stage. And each of the chapters in the American story then relates to a section of the books. We're very lucky that part of the funding for the library is funding for two scholars to work with us annually. So in addition to our very small staff team, where I'm the only full-time staff member, we have two PhD students from the local university who are American nationals. And at the moment, we're joined by two, uh, two aspiring authors who are uh, studying at the School of Literature, Drama and Creative Writing at the University of East Anglia. And they, amongst all the wonderful things they do for us, they maintain a scholar's blog for us also. We appeal mostly to an adult audience, it has to be said, with the 4,000 book collection, fiction and non-fiction, but we do also have a small storytelling collection for children and young people, and we also try to include children and young people in as many of our event programmes as possible. We are um, in many, many different places online, so um, I do hope that if any of you have any questions or queries, and we don't even, and if we don't get to them today, that you will seek us out online and uh, get in touch. Thank you, and I will pass over to Victoria in Virginia. All right, the Norfolk Public Library in Virginia is a library system of 12 different branches. Uh, here are six of them. Most of our branches are called neighborhood branches. This means that they are small, meant for a local community. You usually have a collection of several thousand books, DVDs, and audiobooks. And then we have two multi-story buildings, the Jordan Newby Anchor Branch Library at Broad Creek and the Mary D. Pretlow Branch Library. These are the two on the left. Um, we also have a brand new library, which is the far right photo, the Richard Tucker Memorial Library, which recently opened. We have a population about 250,000 we serve. Um, our library system first started in 1872 out of Norfolk Academy. Um, it was incorporated by the General Assembly in 1894. By 1902, there were three separate library systems in the Norfolk Public Library. Um, our public library collection, one out of the YMCA and the Norfolk and Portsmouth Bar Association Law Library. And then in 1904, the public library opened free. Um, before that, public libraries were a small fee. Our first branch opened in 1916. This is the Van Wyck Branch Library. It is a currently used branch of our library. Um, it's right next to a high school. As you can see on the left was how it looked when it first opened. And on the right is it today. Uh, the building has not changed in any way except the entrance is now on the side. 
Uh, later in 1921, we opened the Blyden Branch, which was the first library for African Americans supported by a municipality in Virginia. Um, this is Dr. Blyden on the left, and here are some f historical photos of the branch when it was first being used. We have a lot of different programming that we do. Uh, right now, we're really into virtual programming. Uh, we don't have in-person programming back quite yet, um, but we do a lot of baby garden, kinder reads. Uh, we have a podcast for mental health, um, and we do a lot of programs related to uh, multicultural history, especially African-American and local history. We also have an equipment library, so you can rent a telescope, a backpack with um, a pass to all of the uh, nature parks in uh, Virginia. You can get instruments. You can get one of five American Girl dolls with their original books. You can rent a Wi-Fi hotspot, and you can even rent a metal detector or a coda pillar. And then our newest library, we have a brand new thing called a Nature Explorium. It's an outdoor explore area for children. So the children will be able to learn hands-on um, with water play, with digging. Uh, there is also uh, boards where they can write. Um, there's all sorts of different activities they can do. And this is the first Nature Explorium in Virginia. And it's modeled off of the family place model, which is out of Long Island. And now on to Anne in Connecticut. Thank you, Victoria. In 1888, when the Norfolk Library was built, there was no existing facility in our town for a library, although the town was over a century old. The existing public library, so to speak, was simply a collection of books kept in a single oak bookcase, which periodically traveled from house to house, the homeowner serving as temporary librarian. This early Norfolk Library did, however, have a constitution written in 1822, which determined which books would or would not be purchased for the traveling bookcase. The development of the collection of this early Norfolk Library was closely monitored by a committee of three. At one time, Isabella Eldridge, who founded the Norfolk Library, her mother, Sarah Eldridge, pictured at the top right, was in charge of purchasing books. So with this background in librarianship, it was natural that Isabella would have thought to build a library as a suitable memorial to her parents after they died. But perhaps there was another reason she wanted to build a library. Article nine of the Norfolk Library Constitution of 1822 reads at the bottom, Norfolk novels and romances shall not be purchased for the library. Perhaps Isabella chafed at the restriction, no romances. She was, after all, 29 years old at the time of her mother's death, unmarried. But that remains speculation. What we do know is that Isabella decided to build this remarkable library that we have today in our small town. And her choice of architect to do that was a very bold one. Although he was known for having designed the President Garfield Memorial in Cleveland, pictured at the left, and the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial Arch in Hartford, pictured at the right, he had no history in Norfolk or Northwest Connecticut, and he had never designed a library before. His materials of choice, moreover, brownstone, fish scale shingles, and red tile had not been used here before. So why did she choose this unusual architect for Norfolk. Well, George Keller was a number of architects whose romantic Victorian vision is reflected in buildings constructed in Hartford in the second half of the 19th century. At that time, Hartford was in its golden age. It was the capital of Connecticut and the wealthiest city in the country. Moving counterclockwise on the screen, we can see that Hartford was at the forefront of, of um, culture with the oldest museum in the country, the Wadsworth Athenaeum. It was at the forefront of education 
Trinity College's long walk, which is pictured at the lower left, and of industry. You can see the Onion Dome of Samuel Colt's Armory at the lower right. It was home to the literati of Nook Farm, including Mark Twain, whose house is at the upper right. This is romantic architecture, one that often refers to exotic civilizations, note the Onion Dome of Colt's factory, and the castle-like exterior of the Wadsworth Athenaeum. Or exotic personalities, such as Mark Twain, whose house was said to resemble a Mississippi River steamboat, its third floor terrace, the pilot house, its veranda, the ship's deck, and the house poised to set sail. Such symbolism would be typical of romantic Victorian architecture. This architecture appealed to Isabella, and so she commissioned George Keller to design a library that brought color to Norfolk and materials, brownstone, fish scale shingles, red tile roof that had not been seen before in Northwest Connecticut. This is a photograph of the library during the days of, days of gas lighting in the 1890s. It had quickly become the centerpiece of town. It was Isabella's hope that it would be a meeting ground for the community rather than just an institution. And she arranged for a program of concerts and lectures each year. Among those who spoke at the library was Admiral, Admiral Robert Peary, credited with leading the first expedition to the North Pole in 1909. He was scheduled to speak at the library in February of 1912. However, an ice storm in Norfolk prevented him from reaching the icebox of Connecticut, which of course made the headlines of the local paper. This is a photograph of the library after an ice storm of 1898. In 1909, on the 20th anniversary of the library, townsfolk gave to Isabella Eldridge a bronze bas-relief of Robert Louis Stevenson, modeled by Augustus St. Gaudens. It now hangs in our reference room and shows Stevenson on a daybed propped up with pillows and with pen and paper in hand. The bas-relief is mounted on a marble plaque inscribed in gilt given to Isabella Eldridge, founder by her loving friends and townspeople on the 20th anniversary of the library, March 6, 1889 through March 6, 1909. Today, the Norfolk Library remains an important resource for the community with a wide array of services and cultural programs open to all free of charge. With its high vaulted ceilings of polished wood and luminous stained glass windows, the library beckons students, casual readers, book groups, and performers who marvel at the acoustic in the Great Hall. Monthly art exhibits hang on the walls and a large screen can be lowered to show films. The Great Hall can become festive in December with our annual carol sing. With holiday garlands still up in January for this samba concert that spontaneously turned into a dance. These are obviously pre-pandemic photographs. The library has been open for circulation during the pandemic as we are fortunate to have the space for patrons to browse while keeping socially distant and we have e-media. Our, our in-house programs are pretty much on hold, although we have started um, meeting again. The Norfolk Knitters love to meet every Friday afternoon here in the Great Hall, and in the wintertime we will light a fire for them. This is um, a couple of photographs of uh, virtual programs that we've had, which have drawn in people near and far. And this is a photograph of our Great Hall with the comfortable leather chairs Children love to come to the library. Two years ago, we refurbished the children's room and they love to nestle with a book. Um, they meet a, they've met a llama at the library, a chicken, and um, dress up frequently. The turret in the children's room, visible there on the right, uh, mimics the turret in the front of our building. The library can be a quiet environment where friends gather for knitting or scrapbooking. 
Our rare book room holds the library's original collection, some of the books dating back to the 1600s, such as three rare Elizabeth editions in original vellum, bindings of the complete works of Greek philosopher Seneca, compiled by German classicist J.F. Grinovius and the original visitors registers in which we do find the signature of Mark Twain in 1906. Our newest addition is a seed library placed in a repurposed wooden catalog where patrons can check out seeds and replenish the supply after harvest. In 1889, one entered the library hall under wooden fretwork which spelled out the words, silence is golden. While there will always be silent spaces in the library, it is the sense of community experienced here that makes the Norfolk Library a very special place. And with that, I pass it on to Libby in Massachusetts. Great, thanks, Anne. Okay, um, the Norfolk Public Library was founded in 1880. A gift of 100 volumes was given by a private citizen group known as the Norfolk Library Association and by loan of additional books from the Norfolk Farmers Club. For 12 years, the library was housed in the first floor of the old town hall. It was open between seven to 9 p.m. on Saturday nights to coincide with the Norfolk Brass Band rehearsal, which was held in the same room. Um, the question began what to, where to house the growing book collection, and in 1898, the library was moved to the tower room on the second floor of the center school, where it stayed until 1919, when the town appropriated $350 to rent and furnish a room at the old Baptist church. Um, there it remained until the Grange bought the building and requested that the library be moved, so in 1951, you can see by the picture on the left, um, uh, the oldest portion of the present building was prepared for occupancy. So um, this, this building here, before it was a library in um, 1951, it was a school and then a firehouse. And I will talk a little bit about that in um, one of my next slides. Um, however, in 1962, uh, an addition of 650 square feet was added on to the original structure. So you can see the original structure with the entrance there and the little steeple, and then on the side, they added on to it. Okay, so a little bit of history about the, the um, schoolhouse. It was actually in 1845, um, it was the North School, and it was first located at a different location in town. Then it was moved to the current site around 1899, and it became a fire truck house. Um, for the new hook and ladder. Um, uh, and then it was the firehouse uh, school in 1926. Uh, and then uh, the Norfolk Public Library in 1951. What's interesting though, is that um, the schoolhouse is still there. As you can see in the picture on the right, the red building is the original part of the library. And then it was just added on uh, when we made additions. Um, it is actually um, still there right now, as I said, and it served, it was renovated and it serves as one of our beautiful um, meeting rooms in our library. In 18, um, I mean, in, sorry, in 1985, an addition was completed, um, bringing the total available space to 8,000 square feet. You can just see that it was added on. And then in 2004, the library was relocated temporarily uh, for a major addition and renovation. Uh, in, 2000, in November 2005, the library reopened and the facility was um, 23,000 square feet and that you can see on the picture on the bottom and also the picture on the right is the entrance of the library. So a little bit about our library now. Um, we have 13 employees, five, uh, four full-time, nine part-time. Um, wrapping up the fiscal year um, in 2021, our total print collection consists of 174,295 physical items. We have state, statewide databases and electronic resources, including Overdrive, Libby um, for eBooks and audiobooks, Hoopla, which is sponsored by our wonderful friends group. We have Canopy and Ancestry.com. We have a stuff library uh, or a library of things collection that includes yard games, tools, hotspots, e-readers, kitchen gadgets and cookers like an air fryer, um, musical instruments and more. 
We offer a multitude of programs in person and now virtually for patrons of all ages. Some of our favorites are now um, outside story times, crafting programs, and our read it and eat it program, which is a um, potluck cookbook club. Uh, with a recent grant, we used our funds to um, create and open up a maker lab, which is fully equipped with a 3D printer, coding and robotic kits, a leather kit, um, craft supplies, button maker, sewing machine, and more. And I do have a library video, but I'm going to stop. I was having some trouble, so I'm going to stop sharing and go to a different screen um, with the video. And my wonderful staff member, Rachel, I have to give her credit for this. Um, she made this video. And I will play this. All right, and that is um, the video of my uh, Norfolk, Massachusetts library. And I now pass it over to uh, Jessica in Nebraska. Thank you all. Hey, thank you. I love that video. Okay. So the library in uh, Norfolk, Nebraska got started in the early 1900s by our local women's club. Uh, like many at the time, it was also a private subscription-based library. Um, but they did petition three times to Andrew Carnegie to get a public, uh, free public library building built and were successful in 1908 getting that grant from Andrew Carnegie. And so the Norfolk Carnegie Library was finished in 1910 and opened there. Um, Norfolk decided they had outgrown that library by the 1970s and in 1977 a new library was built. Uh, the old Carnegie building does still stand and is not used as a library anymore, but it is still uh, being used by the community and it is on the state uh, historical register as a historical building. Um, and then uh, just a few years ago, we got a wonderful renovation and expansion to that in 1977 building. And so that is what our building looks like right now, newly expanded and renovated in 2018. And uh, we have uh, lucky to have this great, beautiful, grassy uh, area to the north of the library, uh, which we are able to use for programs and has been very helpful during uh, COVID times to be able to have outdoor story time, uh, musical performers, and things like that on the lawn. We also have this outdoor courtyard, which is a great extension uh, of the library building that people can use when the weather is nice. And we have pickup lockers and a drive up window as well for easy access during, um, well, at really any time, but especially when the library is closed, people can pick up items 24 seven in those lockers. Um, we do have a great big community room. It seats about 200. It can be subdivided into three smaller spaces. And these rooms are used a lot by the community for lots of different um, groups from knitting groups and bridge club to um, community forums and um, workshops, conferences, educational events for nonprofits in the agency or in the area. 
So there's our service desk and our self-check machines and our computer lab for adults. And then this shows also our maker space and our heritage room, which we'll take a little peek at. Our heritage room has uh, these original tables from that 1910 Carnegie Library. And this is where we have our um, Nebraska history collection, genealogy materials, and also um, our uh, closed stacks collection, which has um, you know, yearbooks and city directories and things back to the 1800s. There's our maker space, and um, we have a 3D printer, a button maker, a sewing and embroidery machine, a laser cutter, a design computer with specialized software for all of those machines, and then also a Cricut machine. And that's uh, standing at the south of our library looking north. You can see pretty much all of the building inside that way. Everything is um, open, lots of natural light, as you can see, something that we really loved after the 1970s building, which had very limited windows. Um, this is our teen area and our fireplace area. This is our traditionally quiet space by the newspapers and magazines. And then going around that courtyard from the inside, uh, we can walk into our kids area, which we has this beautiful imagination forest, which is interactive and playful. Um, and invites the kids to really engage with books. They can climb up and take their book into the top level of the low tree house and read up there. Lots of fine motor skill manipulatives as well and interactive features for younger kids in that area. And some fun uh, non-traditional seating like the little houses and the little doggy desks that they can sit in. This is our children's desk, which I uh, love those little steps on the side so kids can interact with the staff and help check out their books. And then you can see our activity room behind that where we have our most of our story time programs and children's programming in that room. Uh, we on average have about 140,000 visits, um, not counting all the people who use the meeting rooms, our cafe area and the restrooms, which are outside of our official uh, library gate counters. Um, we have about 13,000 cardholders that come from about a 70 mile range. As I mentioned earlier, we are a regional hub. We do not have a residency requirement to get a library card. So as long as someone lives, works, attends school, shops, comes to town often enough that they feel like they want a card, they can get one. Uh, we typically have about 500 programs a year with more than 13,000 participants. Um, and then we have usually about 300,000 of the items used with print and digital checkouts. Um, items used in the library, use of the computers, et cetera. And here's most of our staff. That's not quite all of us, but that's most of us. And there's my contact information if anyone has any other questions. That's it for us. Great, thank you, Jessica. And thank you to all of you um, for sharing. Uh, let's see, so we have, if anyone else wants, some questions have already been answered, but if anyone else has any questions and wanted to type it in the Q&A, um, we have just a couple of minutes left to, um, to answer these, but maybe let's get started. Um, I think one here, the, oh, well, thank you. The Norfolk, Massachusetts Library is truly the most beautiful and peaceful place in our small community. Awesome. Thank you, Dennis. Um, uh, many Norfolks are our larger cities. You <laughs> may have more competition. Any observations on how your community views your, your Norfolk library? Do you guys want to answer that? We can maybe start with, we can go in the same format maybe, Orla? I, yes. Um, well, our library, the American Library, is inside the Norfolk and Norwich Millennium Library. So the, the big uh, library that we're part of is actually the busiest public library in the UK. So I think reviewed pretty positively. Um, I will say that our little American library probably creates a little bit of confusion sometimes until people have come through the door and maybe figure out why we're here, um, because it is quite un quite an unusual um, an unusual entity. But uh, yeah, I mean we're we're well used, and I think that people have a lot of fondness for the library as like the last public space, I guess, you know, we're free, open to all and very welcoming. And I think, uh, yeah, it, we're definitely a positive presence in the local community. All right, um, do we wanna go in the same order as we've been going? Maybe Victoria can speak now from Virginia? Yes, absolutely. Um, so we are definitely a positive and well-loved presence as shown by during COVID, we had closed all but two of our branches. So out of 12, we had two. 
and then they were only doing grab and go. So the city actually launched a large grassroots campaign to have us come back. So you would see signs that said, bring back our libraries. Um, I would get notices because I run the mobile services of this place needs you to go out there. They, they need somebody to deliver books to them. Um, and then even when we did get some of the libraries back, there were still people pushing for them to be open more, ask for more. Um, and the reception for our new library with the Nature Explorium has been phenomenal. It's in a very um, southern part of our city that previously had no library uh, services really close to it in a safe walking distance. And the reception has been phenomenal. So I would say we're a very positive presence in our system. Um, uh, so, Anne? Yeah, well, we're lucky um, to have such a beautiful building because it's a centerpiece of town. It's just by its very architecture, it becomes an incredibly beautiful, peaceful place to um, gather in and spend time in. Um, also, there's a, you know, we're a small town and there's a wonderful sense of community anyway, and this um, lends itself for people um, gathering here. Um, I've noticed that the real estate agents in town always come through the library as they're showing people houses in Norfolk to buy. They're like, oh, you have to see our library. So <laughs> that's sort of um, indicative of how special it is to the town. And um, yeah, so... Libby, we, we already know somebody thinks your library is the most beautiful and peaceful place. Yeah, I, I just wanted to touch on that. I think Dennis said it really well, but I think that, um, you know, we not only offer a lot of programming to the library, we try to, you know, reach a lot of different people. Um, but I, I, we have a, I didn't mention in, our, in my library presentation, but um, along with the schoolhouse meeting room, we also have a community me meeting room. So I feel like a lot of um, Girl Scouts, Cub Scouts, like all different kinds of town organizations uses our library and then they trickle. That's sort of outside of the library doors, but they also sort of trickle into the library. And, you know, when we were able to reopen our doors after the pandemic, you know, we really did notice how important the library is, uh, not only for information, but just as a gathering place. People were just so excited to be able to come back and just chat with us and gather and talk with others. So, um, yeah, community space is really important in town. Uh, Jessica? Well, I, I liked how Orla said earlier, self-praise is no praise at all, but I think so. We have to toot our own horn sometimes, and um, I do think that we're a well-loved institution in town. Um, when we were wanting to do a renovation and expansion, we went to the voters to help fund that, and it passed the first time at the ballot. So we took that as a strong show of support from our community. And since we've opened in the new building with so much more community space, like you said, Libby, that community gathering space, that place to meet and, and have those Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts and all those community groups has been really important and I think really valuable to our town. So we do feel a lot of love and support from our community. Um, let's see, another question. Can you give an example of a particular cherished item in your collection? Um, does anybody want to speak on that? Orla? Yeah. So the most cherished item, the most important item in our collection is our Roll of Honour, which has the names of the 7,000 or so um, men who lost their lives in World War II. And unfortunately, the original Roll of Honour was destroyed in that library fire in 1994. Uh, but we have the new role of honor now and um, yeah it's it's very very special and very important and uh, we also are really lucky to have a letter from the queen which congratulated us on our opening um, of the library in 2001 so the role of honor is the most important thing we have um, the letter from the queen is probably my my secret kind of guilty favorite <laughs> Uh, so in Norfolk, Virginia, I would not say that we have a particularly cherished item so much as a particularly cherished collection. We have something called the Sargent Memorial Collection. It is all about um, the Virginia area as well as gene genealogy. So with Norfolk being um, so, well, at least in American terms, old, uh, we're several centuries old, there's genealogy. This is particularly helpful for people who have um, enslaved ancestors uh, who were from this area, 
We also have a large Jewish population. So we have all these old photos and you can actually reach out to them and get copies of them. So it's just this really cool geneal genealogical collection that we have. And it's housed um, in, our, in our downtown area. So you can easily go up to it, anyone who wants to. Uh, so that would be our most cherished item is the collection. I guess it's my turn here in Norfolk. Um, well, again, I'm gonna actually turn to my personal favorite because there are probably many different items that we could talk about as most cherished, but I particularly love this um, engraved card that we have on display on the wall in a bronze triptych that was um, made by Tiffany and company um, in 18, 19, 1909, which was um, upon the 20th anniversary um, of the library's opening. And it's a card to Isabella um, inscribed with all the names of the donors who gave money for that plaque of Robert Louis Stevenson that I showed in the slideshow. And these are the names of the residents who at the time used the library. And, um, you know, many of them are were obviously summer residents. Um, who perhaps contributed more than others or, you know, or not. Many were, um, I, I'm the town historian, so I, I know who these people were. And they range from um, the president of Johns Hopkins University signed it, the president of Remington Arms Company signed it, the farmer signed it, the meat market merchant signed it, a salesman signed it, a livery man signed it. Um, 12 school children signed it, um, many of them Irish American, African American. So to me, this is a testament that the library uh, was a welcoming place to all Norfolk residents um, at the time. And I just love this document hanging on our wall. Libby? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Anne. I have a couple um, answers to this one. Um, I would of course have to say our local history collection, um, we have that housed in our schoolhouse actually. And I just really enjoyed diving into that when I was reaching, uh, researching for this, for this program. Um, I would say another more um, current collection that we have that people really appreciate and cherish is our stuffed bray collection. Um, you know, I think it's really fun um, that people can check out an item and either test it out before they're gonna buy it or, um, just we have like an ice cream maker or like a uh, uh, something like that that you can use for a party or something. So instead of having to buy it um, and spend this money you, and you just need it for one time, you can actually uh, to take it from the library and use it for your party. So I think that's wonderful. Um, not quite a, um, an item in the collection, but a very cherished um, item in our library you met Bill, um, Bill the Bear, um, who gave you a tour of our library. He is very cherished um, with the families of, of Norfolk. So that, that would be my other answer to that question. Um, we do have to wrap up soon, but I think maybe quickly the last question here, which is a great way to end this program. Um, what do you see in the future? Wendy said, um, what do you see in the future of your libraries? Orla, do you wanna take that away? Oh gosh, um, so we just had a big refurbishment and rebrand last year and we had a lot of very exciting plans which have had to be somewhat put on hold. So next year in April or May time we are hoping, hoping to have a big relaunch which will be very exciting and we will be joined hopefully by lots of friends from the United States and I think that in general we will be doing more programming online. We're going to be working hopefully, you know, um, more with with um, groups like you guys and, and you know, doing programming that allows us to reach audiences both in person in the library and in the States at the same time. And I think that um, that probably would have, was something we were going to work on anyways, but for sure the pandemic has hastened the process and meant that we had to pick up those kind of digital skills pretty quick. So yeah, I see um, very good, positive and exciting things and uh, hopefully a return to uh, a lot of those things happening in library as well as online. Uh, hand over to Virginia. Um, so here in Norfolk, Virginia, we are uh, 
improving our virtual programming. Um, we're looking to create a, a much higher level of virtual programming that we, we're doing. Um, and we are also creating a maker space at our Pretlo library that should be opening sometime soon. Um, I'm not exactly sure when the public will be able to use it, uh, but it's going to have everything from sewing to 3D printers um, to all sorts of robotics. So that's going to be a really cool development for us. So Anne, uh, take it away. Yeah, I well, I echo what Orla has said and that I feel like the silver lining of the pandemic has been um, the introduction of digital programming. And um, although, uh, you know, it's always nice to, to um, have in-house program and see people face to face in a very small community like ours, which is, you know, as I said, 1600 and less in the winter, it's, um, you know, it's, it's difficult to engage people and, you um, I think that this digital platform offers the possibility. As an example, we have our wonderful book group, which um, meets monthly, um, led by the incredible Mark Scarborough, who has published 32 cookbooks. And to each meeting, he used to bring um, treats, which everybody would look forward to having during halftime um, as they discussed various books. He was he's a remarkable facilitator. Well, he went um, online, virtual, um, at the start of the pandemic, and we are back um, now with in-house programming. However, Mark and I decided we just have to keep it virtual because he has people tuning in from Australia, Macau, Hawaii, England. I mean, it's it's tripled the number of, of book groupers, so to speak. And um, although they don't, aren't a physical presence in the library, it is a way to, a way to engage our um, community at large. Most of them have some connection with Norfolk, whether they lived here in the past or have had relatives here or something. It is There is a Norfolk connection, but they are not in Norfolk now, and yet they are still engaged in our library activities. So. Um, for Massachusetts, I would echo everything that, um, you know, you guys have said. Uh, I think that our hope is for after the pandemic to really be able to bring people back into the library to um, um, gather and, and socialize and have fun and um, really be using the library again, like pre-pandemic times. But I think that, you know, uh, in looking forward, I think we are going to be doing um, integrating a lot more virtual programming just to be able to hit people that might not be able to, you know, have to put the kids to bed, but still want to come to a program and they can just hop right on virtual. I think that's been really um, great for us to, to realize that. Um, and also increasing funds for digital, um, digital ebooks, audiobooks. Uh, people that were so against doing that in the pandemic have been sort of forced to um, learn how to use the digital resources for ebooks and audiobooks. So definitely putting more funds into that, um, expanding those collections, um, and possibly exploring databases too. And I want to hand it over to Jessica in Nebraska. Okay, well, I think we're in a very similar place to lots of other folks. Um, you know, we're really looking forward to uh, getting back to really uh, community engagement and being able to really reach out to folks and, and not only bring them into the library, but have us bring the library to them and where they are. Um, so that's definitely something in our um, next few years that we really want to um, not just get back to where we were before, but do better than what we did before and uh, just reach out more that way. So this has been a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you all so much for joining us. Again, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, there is a recording and we will be posting it on the Norfolk, Connecticut Library's YouTube channel and also sending that link to all the um, attendees today and to other people who have asked us for it. So um, stay tuned for that. And thank you so much, Libby, for um, coming up with this wonderful idea. It's been just terrific be feeling connected to Massachusetts, mm -hmm. Nebraska, Virginia, and Orla in Norwich. Um, <laughs> it's just wonderful. So Thank you all so much. And um, with that, I think we can um, end the webinar and um, hope to see you all sometime in the future. Yes, thank, thank you everybody. everybody. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.